Well, how many of y'all are glad to be in the house of God with God's people today? Amen? We get to celebrate. We are continuing the series of Share. And today I want to look at a story in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4. Before we get to the reading, though, I want to set up the story. It's a familiar story. It's one I preached before we went through Acts maybe a few times in the life of the church. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are going into the temple. And as they are going into the temple, there is a man who is 40 plus years of age who has been brought there day after day at the temple to beg for money. And as they're entering through the temple, he's looking, he's begging for money. He's wanting money from Peter and John. And Peter looks at him and asks the man to look at him. And he says, silver and gold, we have none. But in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, take up your bed, arise and walk. And the man, it says, is healed. And he begins to, he begins walking, leaping, and praising God. Now, how many of y'all believe that if you hadn't walked in 40 plus years, and you are now able to walk, that would be a good day. And you would be walking, and you might be leaping, and you might be praising God. What do you think? Well, he began to pray so much commotion, like he just won a big football game, and he's shouting and praising and just doing all kinds of things. It draws a commotion. And everybody starts coming in wanting to know what's going on. Because they've seen... Oh, Joe here at the gate, he's never walked before. Now, I don't know if his name is Joe. I'm just going to name him Joe for this, for the reason for today, okay? So don't go saying there's a, there's a man named Joe in the Bible that couldn't walk. No, I'm just making up a name. But here's old Joe. He's there after, day after day. They see him every day. But now he's in the temple course walking. Now, how many of y'all think that would make you scratch your head just a little bit? Huh? Any of y'all get curious about anything? Any of you all ever ever uh, see some commotion going on? Y'all ever been in a place where commotions happen? Maybe where a fight maybe it's broke out? What some of y'all do? Now some leave and say, oh, I got to get out of here. What, what, what do some of you others do? Oh, you got to get a little closer. You got to see what's going on, right? Well, they start wanting to know what's going on. They're seeing this guy because they've known him. They've known Joe. He hadn't walked in years. And now he's walking and he's leaping and he's praising God. And so they're all gathered around. And so what, what Peter does, he does something uh, He does something amazing. He just preaches the gospel. He, he doesn't use it for his own platform. One thing we don't see Peter do, Peter doesn't say... Um, Hey, guys, yes, I, I, I did this by the power of myself, and, uh, and you can come to my healing crusade next week. No, he doesn't do that. He just gives Jesus the credit. He begins preaching Jesus, and there's multiple people that, that come to faith. In fact, it says over 5,000 people come to know the Lord. Now, if 5,000 people come to know Jesus in the ministry, we call that a good day. That is an exciting day, 5,000 people coming to know the Lord. Well, how many of y'all realize that when God starts moving, Satan gets nervous? When the gospel begins to advance, the enemy comes on attack. And so he begins stirring the religious leaders of the day. And, and the religious leaders want to find out what's going on. And so they arrest Peter and John. And that brings us to where we want to start today. So if you would stand for the honor of reading God's word, we'll be in Acts 4, starting with verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men 
by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through men is evident and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Let's pray. Lord, we we come today to hear from you, to worship you to learn more from you, God. And I pray that as we look at the text today, that you would stir our spirits, Lord, those of us who know you, that we would be challenged today to live louder than the chaos and the destruction and the brokenness of this world. And that our lives would be a living testimony to the power of Jesus who changes us. And Lord, today, if someone does not know you, that today would be a day that they would trust and call upon the name of the Lord. So help me to preach plain and clear today, Lord. I do realize that there is a strict judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word truth, and I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, and his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I think in this story, one thing we notice quickly is what only religion can do. How many of y'all realize that religion can only aid you in your sickness rather than heal you? He was being brought every day to the temple. You see, the only thing that religion will do is, is carry you while you're crippled, but a relationship with Jesus can transform you, can save you, can make you whole. Religion can't save you. It can't deliver you. It can only give you some help in your misery, but it can never give you the life-changing power that comes only through Jesus. And so these friends of this man have been coming and doing only what he can do, and that's beg. He can't work. He can't have a job, but he can beg. And so every day as the people go to worship, as the people go to, to go into the house of the Lord, uh, they see him every day and they, they just drop him some money. But something's about to change in this man's life. Because he is going to encounter some people that just doesn't have a religion, but some folks that's been in a personal relationship and knows Jesus. And how many of y'all know that Jesus changes everything? That when you know Jesus, he changes your whole life. And so Peter and John come walking in that day, and this this man's life was about to forever change. He couldn't give them money. They didn't have it. But what they could give them was what God could give them. And when he said, arise and walk, this man, he rose and he walked. For the first time in his life, he began walking. And when he was walking, he heard that the name of Jesus is what brought the healing. He began praising and glorifying the name of Jesus. Can you imagine there in the temple, in the Jewish temple, the temple of the religious leaders who just got rid of Jesus, who just had Jesus crucified, some 40-some days later, all of a sudden, there's this man in the temple talking about Jesus. And man, it drew the crowd. And they are interested. And Peter takes advantage of that opportunity and he preaches the gospel to them. He talks about how you handed over the author of life. 
how you, you, you had the, the righteous one crucified, but how that God raised him from the dead. And he told the crowd, repent, turn away, turn back to God so that you can receive a season of refreshing, that your sins might be blotted out. How many of y'all realize, remember the day that you gave your heart and life to Jesus and you were saved from your sin? How many of y'all remember? Can you remember that day when you called upon the name of the Lord to save you? Now, let me just ask you, did you feel a burden rolled away? Did you feel like there was a weight that you were carrying you that was just lifted? Did you feel a rushing, a feeling of the love of Jesus that just filled you? Because the Bible says that when we are born again, when we're regenerated, when we're made new, we become a whole new creation and the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of us. The Bible refers to the Holy Spirit in this way as well, living water. And so Peter says, return to God so that seasons of refreshing may come to you. I don't know about you, but the the refreshing water of Jesus has forever changed my life. And Jesus said that if you taste of him and drink of that water, you'll never thirst again. How many of y'all have been satisfied in Jesus have you all been satisfied by the grace of Jesus, by his mercy, by his, by his salvation that he has given you? It is like honey in a rock. Amen. Oh, it's how sweet it is to trust in who? Jesus. And we got to share that. We got to tell that. And this man, he's, he's, he's testifying. His life's been changed. People are coming to faith. And that's making some other folks upset. They don't like it. Any of y'all ever been in trouble before? How many, how many of y'all in grade school ever got in trouble? Anybody ever get in trouble in, in, in grade school? Uh, how many of y'all ever got your name put on the chalkboard? Anybody get your name put on the chalkboard? Now, no pointing fingers, Jason. No, no. <laughs> get your name put on the chalkboard. That's when the teacher, teacher called you out. Uh, one or two many times, your name went on the chalkboard. They used to do this. Now, they probably don't do this now because they're afraid it's going to hurt your feelings, but they used to put our name on the chalkboard so that the whole class can know who's acting like a fool. So there, your name would go up there. Boop, there's a big grant and, uh, because I was talking maybe something, doing something I shouldn't be in class. And then, so there, my name goes down there. And then if you got too carried away again, after that, they'd put what? They'd put a check mark. Now, that teacher would try to deal with you as long as he or she could. Now, if you acted honorary enough, guess what they'd do? Well, they, they, they could paddle you, uh, or they'd send you where? To the principal's office. And if you got sent to the principal's office, what did you know? You were, you were in trouble. They had what was called back then in the day called the Board of Education. And it wasn't a council member of board members. It was a wooden board that they would use to educate you on the behind. Have any of y'all ever get one of those educations? Anybody get an education by the board? Amen. I tell you what. I tell you what's not a good day is when you get one of those uh, educations when you're wearing parachute pants. <laughs> that was not a good day, and I sounded like Michael Jackson. And uh, it, it was not a good day. And so, and so when you got sent to the principal's office, you knew the teacher meant business. You were in trouble. Now, Peter and John, they're preaching Jesus. This man's been healed. 5,000 people are now praising the name of Jesus. They bring the big guys out. I mean, Peter and John, they got themselves into trouble. Look what it says there in verse 5. On that next they get arrested, and then on that next day, they get sent to the principal's office. Who's among these folks? Well, it says Annas, the high priest. So they come before the high priest, Caiaphas. He was the high priest once. Now his son-in-law, Annas, is the high priest. Annas and Caiaphas are two that were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. They're in hot water. They're brought before the religious authorities, those who have the power 
those who control the people, those who are in charge of the narrative. And they don't like this news about Jesus going out, so they need to stop it rather quickly. And so they bring the big boys in, and they bring Peter and John in, and they want to know by what authority did this man get healed in. And Peter, notice what I said, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit. How many all realize that, that we need to be people who are full of the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, emboldened by the Holy Spirit? And so Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, then says to them in verse 8, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, if you have your Bible open right there, I would underline that word healed. We'll get to that just in a moment. Just make note of that. He's asking, if you're wondering by what manner that he has been healed, verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the name, Peter didn't do it, John didn't do it, The Sadducees didn't do it. The Pharisees didn't do it. The Sanhedrin court didn't do it. But at the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and then he goes on a preaching. He he, he has to get a little sermon in there. What's he say? Whom you want? Whom you crucified? Whom God raised from the dead? Well, what's he preaching? The gospel. And what is the gospel? The what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What's the gospel? That Jesus died for our sin. So on the cross, we are forgiven of our sin. Then he's placed in the tomb. And on that third day when he rose again, the resurrection then assures us of life eternal. So through the cross, we've been forgiven of our sin. By the power of the resurrection, we've been given new life in Christ. Amen? So it's the cross and the resurrection. It's called the gospel, the good news. And so what does Peter preach to them? Preaches the gospel. They needed to hear the gospel. They needed to know the power of the resurrection. Guess what people need to hear today? The gospel. And so he he, he brings that out. God raised him from the dead. Now he says... By him, meaning Jesus, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. That's a prophecy. He says, the builders, you should have recognized him. You should have known Jesus. You should, being people of the, of the Old Testament scriptures, you should have known. You should have been able to recognize him, but you rejected him. He is the stone that was rejected, and he's become the cornerstone. Now, how many of y'all know the importance of a cornerstone? Jeff, how important is that cornerstone? It's everything, right? Because everything else is built upon that cornerstone. If it's not built on that cornerstone, it's not a straight building. And if it's not set on that cornerstone, it's not going to stand. It's going to fall. Jesus said, the wise man who hears my teachings, I will tell you how he is. He is like a man who built his house on the rock. And when the waves came and the rain came, it stood. But the foolish man is the one who does not heed my words. He goes and he builds his house on the sand. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. He is everything. He's what life is built around. And if you build your life on anything other than Jesus, it will not stand. What have we been talking about over these weeks? God's got a design, right? God's design is that we would know him, love him, and, and worship him, and be in relationship with him. But man has a natural desire and tendency to what? To depart from God's design. And the Bible calls that what? Sin. We all go our own way. We think we know better than God. And that leads to death or brokenness. But Jesus came to make us whole, to make us complete. This man was crippled from birth. He needed to be made whole. 
So Peter tells him that it's Jesus that did this. He is the cornerstone. Look at verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be what? Saved. Underline that word saved. If you have your Bible, then you have two words that you just underlined. You've underlined healed in verse 9 and saved in verse 12. Those are the same Greek words, sozo. It can mean to be physically made well. Or it also can be, it can mean to be spiritually made well. I believe that Luke here is letting us see a picture of what this man experienced physically to point to the greater reality of what happens to us spiritually. That the greatest need that we have, the greatest healing that we need, The greatest wholeness that needs to come to mankind is the brokenness that sin created, which was separation from God. And so what mankind needs is to be made whole or to be saved by the power of Jesus. Amen? That means everything. Now, it's great to be physically healed, but it's greater to be spiritually healed. Amen? I went to uh, Cleveland with my dad this, this week. Um, he was diagnosed with cancer, and so I, I drove mom and my sister up, and we went there, and, and we met the doctors and the experts in and, and the specific area of cancer that he has. And, and they examined him, ran tests, did some stuff, and they, they talked and said he's got stage 3 cancer and that, that it's curable, and that they're pretty confident that it's curable, that they're going to be able to, to heal him and treat him. And so my dad, he is... Uh, if you, if you meet my dad, you would not think of my dad as some, just this biblical scholar of a man. But he's just, he's a common man who's, old, who's loved Jesus ever since I've known, known him. Ever since I've been a kid, he's, he took us to church. Uh, he taught Sunday school a little bit, and he's, he's been a faithful man of God. And we're talking, and he said, Grant, you know, they said they can heal me, <clears throat> cure me. He said, but, you know, they can't really do that. The only thing they can do is extend my life just a little bit longer. Because I'm going to die eventually. You know? Isn't that the truth? Now, if we get sick and if we can extend our life a little longer, we want that. Amen? We hope that happens and we pray for that to happen. But the reality is this. No matter if we get physically healed... We will die. But when you are born again by the power of the cross and resurrection, when you are saved, when you're made whole, when you've been forgiven of your sin and you've been reborn, then you are promised eternal life and though you die, yet you will live. That is great salvation. That's what it means to be whole. Somebody say amen. Amen. It means everything. My uncle, he was a man of God, and he got, he got cancer. He'd, he was a pop fitter, and he did a lot of work in some bad places, and, and he ended up getting asbestos in his lungs. And, 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 but, you know, when he was going through that whole thing, he'd keep telling me, Grant, he's like, I know God can heal me, but it doesn't matter. God's will be done. You know, this week I preached his funeral. He's now breathing better than he ever has in his life. He knew the Lord. My prayer for you is that you know Jesus. That you've been made whole. That you have been saved. That you've been forgiven of your sin. That you have been born again. That you have been promised eternal life. That you have been given hope for a future. And so so Peter makes it real clear. It's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus that this happens. It's by his name. Now, when they, I believe when, when Peter was preaching, I don't think he was just standing there going, you know, Jesus, whom uh, you rejected and uh, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. I, I, I think he was probably a little bit more animated than that. What do you think? 
You think he's a little bit animated? I think he was. I think he was probably like, and, and there's Jesus whom you crucified. I bet he, gave, he might have gave them a double finger point. I mean, he might have went right at them. Like, whom you crucified, but who God raised the, from the dead. And I believe he was that way because it says, when they saw his boldness. Not when he heard, not when they heard him, but when they saw their boldness. They recognized that they were men who had been with who? Jesus. Now that'll preach right there. And I've preached that a few times. That we should live our lives in such a way where people recognize that we've been with Jesus. Amen? Now I have focused on that part for a lot of time. And this week, man, it's like the Lord just let me see the, the next verse in a whole new way. Look at verse 14. Now they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now look at verse 14. Because uh, this is where I want to start the sermon today. <laughs> But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. I've, 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 I've skipped over that one way too quickly. But seeing the man who was with him, they couldn't say a word. This morning I want to challenge you to live louder, that your life is so transformed by the power of the gospel, that you are so changed, that the way that you live your life is such an example that the critics and the people who hate the faith, the people that want to destroy the faith, they have to stand in silence because the evidence is right there in front of them. They couldn't say a word. The man that couldn't walk, oh Joe, he couldn't walk. But now he's walking. He's right there. They can't deny it. Do you know that the Bible tells us and teaches us that the same spirit who rose Jesus from the grave now lives in us? Are you aware of that? That the spirit of the living God who rose Jesus from the dead lives and dwells inside believers. And so guess what that means? We need to allow the Holy Spirit to transform our lives. We need to be changed people. Amen? You know what the world needs to see? They need to see a bunch of people who claim to be Christians stay married. that has strong marriages. They might not have perfect marriages. They may go through some roughs and bumps and, and some hiccups, but by the grace of God, they make it through. They need to see believers who are free from addiction. Free from... It is, it's, a, it's a sad state when they, they give statistics about Christians' lives. Because studies show that, that there's a high percentage of Christians that are engaged in pornography as much as lost people. That shouldn't be so, right? Because we've been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything about our life ought to be changed. How many of y'all believe that, that when you go to work, you should work differently as a Christian? Because you should recognize Jesus as your boss. When you go into work, that place ought to be blessed. You ought to be uplifting. You ought to be someone that brings life to that. Your boss ought to want to love you being there. In fact, it should be that some Christians have such this good, good name and reputation that the bosses seem to go, even if they're unbelievers, they go, it seems like every time I hire these people that, that talk about the name of Jesus, they're the best workers. We need some of those Jesus people. Wouldn't that be nice? How about going to school? How many of y'all think that you should go to school differently as a believer? Huh? You should walk through the hallways different. 
You should have your college class. You should be different. Your professors ought to, should want to have you in class because you should be the most gracious. You should be the best educated. You should be the ones that study the hardest, that do all of your work and put everything in on time. You ought to be the best. Not that you always have to always make the A's, but you are there who are listening, taking notes, and turning assignments in. How many of y'all think that ought to be a good thing? Amen? That should be what, what it means to, to live louder. So that the teacher, even though they might not be a believer, they say, but that, that man or woman, they were my best student. I wanted to be the best student in the class. Now, I wasn't always the smartest. I didn't get the highest grade every time. And I had professors that weren't believers. I had a professor one day, we, we were at school, and, and they were passing out the Gideon Bibles. Thank God for the Gideons, amen? I love the Gideons. They hand out those Bibles, and I, of course, I had a bunch of Bibles, but they were handing out Bibles, and I thought, I'm not going to turn down a Bible, because I knew that if I took a Bible, it might spark somebody else who might want a Bible. So I get a Bible, and I go to my history class, and I put it on my desk. Now, I wasn't there trying to prove a point, right? I'd like to say that, you know... Here I was as a young man, not ashamed of the Bible, and I wanted to make it known that my Bible was with me. That wasn't the reason. The reason was I got a Bible given to me, and I went to class, and so I just set it on my desk. Well, when I set it on my desk, it must have ticked the history professor off. You know, the name of Jesus. Notice how, how they didn't want the name of Jesus spoken. Y'all realize that it's still that true today? You can, pray to the, you can pray to God of the higher power, God of the, of, of the particles in the sky and the foo-foo dust God. You can pray to any God, but if you name the name of Jesus, people get shook up. That little Gideon New Testament Bible shook this professor up. He, tr- he tried to embarrass me in front of the class because, you know, he goes, Oh, I see you're one of those Christians. Uh, yeah, I, I sit in the front row. I don't know what the people behind me were looking. I know my face was getting red, like, what's happening? He goes, so tell me, uh, what language did your Savior speak? Now, I was in college, so I hadn't been to seminary yet, right? So I didn't know. I was like, uh, King James? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I didn't say King James. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> I was like, oh, that was a good one. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. He said, you mean you're a Christian and you don't even know what language your Savior spoke? You know. As so I just sat there. And then after class, I was like asking my pastor, hey, what language did Jesus speak? So in case everybody needs to know, he he spoke Greek, Aramaic, and he did know Hebrew. And the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, parts of Aramaic, and New Testament in Greek. So if you ever had that happen to you, you were prepared. (laughs) And then from then on out, guess what I had on the corner of my desk every single class? I had that little Gideon New Testament. And he'd look at it all the time. The name of Jesus makes the demons shudder. The name of Jesus causes Satan to tremble. The name of Jesus has the power over the darkness. It's the name of Jesus that truly heals somebody. It's the name of Jesus that really makes somebody that's dead alive again. It's the name of Jesus that makes somebody whole. And so when you speak the name of Jesus, when you live the name of Jesus, when you share the name of Jesus, be be aware. All hell will come against it. But I've got great news. There is no power of hell that is greater than the name of Jesus. And so they said, you know, you can make up rules. You can tell us we're not supposed to uh, preach in his name, but we can't stop preaching in his name. 
And it says that as they were, as they were telling them and charging them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore, they couldn't do anything. They, they punished them, but they couldn't arrest them and because of the crowd that was there. And the crowd, guess what they were doing? Praising God. Every day we read stories, we hear stories about death and brokenness. Just get on your Facebook today and there will be story after story of sickness, disease, death, murder, hatred, greed. There will be all kinds of stories of death, destruction, and brokenness. And here's what I want to see. I want to be part of a church because I think I am. Because I think everyone, I think we want to be people who live louder than the chaos. What do you think? I want to live louder than the headlines. I want to live louder than what, what the world is saying is going on. And I want people to know that there is a God who has came to redeem, restore, deliver, set free, and make whole. What about you? Because Jesus will change everything. Jesus will even, uh, it, it'll, it'll, just, it'll change lives in such a dyna- dynamic way. The, the Apostle Paul, we, we know that he murdered, he, he was in arresting Christians and all these things. And, and he came into a counter with Jesus and guess what happened? His life was forever changed. And about Acts 16, 17, somewhere around in there, he meets up with a man named Silas. And Paul and Silas are preaching in the name of Jesus. Well, you know what happens when you preach in the name of Jesus in areas that they say you can't preach in the name of Jesus? You know where that will land you, don't you? Jail. And so Paul and Silas are now in jail. Now, what did they do when they were in jail? Did they whine and complain and say, God, I can't believe you let me go to jail. Here I am preaching your word. I can't believe you let something like this happen to me. No, what does the Bible say that Paul and Silas did? It says about the midnight hour, they began to sing. Maybe they sang, I am set free. Your praise will ever be on my lips. They got the singing and they got the shouting. And the Bible says, go look it up and read it at home. That the other inmates there, they were listening to Paul and Silas. You know what happens when you, uh, you try to shut up uh, the, the people of God and throw them in jail? You know what happens, don't you? A jail ministry starts. And they just started worshiping the Lord, praising God, singing praises. And then an earthquake happened and shook and the chains fell off of them. Every one of them, even... Paul and Silas and the inmates. And and it says that the prison guard was about to take his sword and kill himself because the prison guard was in charge of all of the men and if they would have escaped, it would have been his life. So he thought, well, they're probably gone. I might as well end my life by my own hand. And he goes to draw his sword and Paul says, wait, stop, don't do that. We're still here. Now what causes a bunch of guys who've been arrested miraculously their chains fall off still remain there because they're living louder they're going to live so loud that it's going to change this man's life and and that, that guard is so overwhelmed he's so astounded because everyone else would have just left right but they're still there and that prison guard he sees these men and man it astounds them and it speaks volumes to him and he asked this question sirs what must I do to be saved and Paul says believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved he gets saved his household gets saved Woo! that's what Jesus does church we need to live louder Our lives need to live above all the noise, 
all the destruction, all the chaos, and our lives need to be changed by the name of Jesus and made whole in such a way that we point people to the one who can redeem. We have to share and live out the good news of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, today, this morning, you're speaking, you're moving. Some, many of us this morning are believers. And maybe we have found ourselves, um, what we would say, lukewarm. Maybe our lives is not as loud as what it needs to be. And maybe we haven't been living the way that we know brings the most honor to you. So Lord, if that's the case, we know that you are gracious. And that we can run to you and experience the refreshing mercy once again. For the Bible says that you do make your mercy new every morning. So, Lord, may we be renewed today, revived today, stirred today. Lord, I pray for those who are here who may need to call upon your name. They've never trusted in you that today they would recognize that their wholeness, their redemption, their purpose can only be found in the name of Jesus through the cross and the resurrection, and that he can give them life everlasting. And so, Lord, speak and move. Have your way. May we respond appropriately. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Let's worship. Let's pray.